apparently there's a new book out on the American positive thinking industry. And it was reviewed recently by someone who came to the States from another country and said this is one of the things she'd found strange about our country was the emphasis everybody put on you have to think positively, you have to have an optimistic outlook. If you're unhappy, it's your fault because you're not thinking positively enough. And both the book and the reviewer are pointing out how really inhumane this attitude is placing the blame for people's suffering on them. In fact, the author of the book was talking about how this is probably a top-down phenomenon. The people in charge want to tell everybody underneath them the reason you're miserable is not because we're taking advantage of you or because we're ripping you off, because you aren't thinking positively enough. And there may be some truth to that. So where does the Dharma come in all this? There's nothing in the Dharma to force you to think positively. It doesn't say you shouldn't suffer, or if you're suffering it's all your own fault. But it does say that you have the choice as to whether you're going to suffer from outside circumstances. The Buddha doesn't say you have to accept the way things are outside that you're not allowed to change. But he's offering you the choice. If you don't want to suffer, here are some tools. And you find that if you want to make change outside, it's a lot better that you're not suffering from a situation you're in. So you can look at it more objectively and figure out what really does need to be changed, where the most affected change would come. A couple of months back I was talking to a group of people about equanimity. And someone was saying, equanimity, teaching people equanimity is pretty hard hard. It's suppose someone's you know, lost a child through murder or suffered some under injust other injustice, and you're telling them they have to be equanimous? And no, the answer is they don't have to be equanimous. But the Buddha is saying you don't have to spend your life in misery over those events. The choice is yours. That's what his teachings on suffering are all about. He offers them as an opportunity. He was not the type of thinker that says, you have to do this, you have to do that. It's remarkable how little he pushes himself on people. In the Vinaya, he does lay down the law for the monks and the nuns. And if they've given themselves to the practice, he demands a higher level of commitment from them. But he never tells anybody they have to do anything in any way. He says, if you want to find true happiness, this is how it's done. If you want to learn how not to suffer, this is how it's done. The choice is yours. So when you find yourself suffering from something, even it's just a bad mood. Remember, the Buddha is not saying you have to get out of the bad mood, or that you're a bad person for being in the bad mood. Simply, he wants to remind you, you have a choice. You can stay in that bad mood, or you can get out. And the main point of his perspective here is that it's not just that you're suffering from the mood, but you're also creating it. You have a role in putting that mood together. And just learning how to remind yourself of that role, that you can step back and look at what you're doing. That right there is half the battle. Because our sense of self does have two roles. On the one hand, it's the experiencer. You're the one who is experiencing the pain experiencing the results of your own actions, the results of other people's actions. But you're also the agent. You're shaping your experience. So 
So when you find yourself in a bad mood, it's not against the principle of acceptance to try to f work your way out of it. After all, what are you accepting? You're simply accepting the fact that you're a passive victim of things. The Buddha never asks you to accept that. He also wants you to accept the fact that you have a role in shaping your experience. That's the essential element in his teaching on conditionality. There are some influences that come in from the past, but there are other things that you have the choice to shape in the present moment. As for what's happened in the past, you can't change that. And the effects that you're feeling from things that happened in the past, you can't change that. But you do have the choice of what you're going to do right now, how you're going to look at the situation. Because this mood is a product of fabrication. And there are three kinds. There's physical fabrication, which is the breath coming in and out, which is something you have some control over. You can change the way you breathe. Nobody's forcing you to breathe in a way that's uncomfortable, that churns up the hormones in your system, that makes you feel tight and depressed, constricted, whatever. You can think about other ways of breathing. Try other ways of breathing. That tackles the, the mood from the physical side. And it's an important part of looking at the mood. If you try to simply think your way out of the mood, you many, many times find yourself stuck. You wonder, well, what is it? What's going on? What? I know all the right things to think, but nothing's happening. That's because you haven't looked at the, the bodily side of the mood. You haven't taken care of that. You have to embody a new way of fabricating your mood if you want to get out of it. So that's the first thing you look at. This is why we practice with the breath so much. So it becomes second nature. As soon as something comes up, you check the breath. And if the breath doesn't feel good, you can change it. And there's verbal fabrication, the way you think about it, the issue at hand. And that's tied in with mental fabrication, your perceptions of what's going on. And one of the big perceptions that keeps you in a bad mood is, why me? Why am I the victim when everybody else is happy, free from suffering? It's because you're not looking. Look around you. There's injustice all over the place. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't fight the injustice that you're suffering from, but it does mean that you have to put it into perspective. It's not just you. So you want to take that perception out of your mind. Think about the Buddha on the night of his awakening. He had those memories of previous lifetimes. And you can be pretty sure that they weren't all pleasant memories memories of injustices that he had suffered from, indignities he had suffered from, stupid things he had done, stupid things other people had done to him. It was all there. But he didn't stop with that knowledge. The next knowledge was, well, the next question was, does this happen just to me or does this happen to everybody, this constant coming back, coming back, coming back in so many different roles, so many different places. And he found it happened to everybody wasn't just him. And when you think about it, how it happens to everybody, you can start seeing patterns. That's what, that's what he did when, when he was thinking about all the beings in the world dying and being reborn. How did it happen? What was in line with their actions? Their actions were shaped by who they respected, who they listened to, what kind of views they had about the principle of action. And that was what enabled him to move on to the third knowledge, looking in the present moment to how his intentions were shaping the present moment, how his views were shaping his experience of the present moment, and what kind of views could be used to put an end to the suffering. So when you find yourself in a bad mood, think in these ways. 
What's the perception you're holding on to? What are the narratives you're telling yourself? What's the context? Can you change this context so you're not suffering? Because a bad mood is a primary example of the Buddhist teachings on the First Noble Truth, the kind of suffering that comes from craving and clinging. And here's your chance to look at it. After all, the duty he recommends for the First Noble Truth is to comprehend it. That means to look at it, watch it, see what you're doing to contribute to that suffering, where you're adding unnecessary suffering to what's going on. Again, the duty here is voluntary. He's not pushing it on you, but he's recommending it. If you find yourself faced by this situation, this is the best thing to do. So even if the world is dumping on you, you don't have to dump on yourself. There's that image the Buddha has of the person being shot by an arrow and then turning around and shooting himself with several more arrows. In other words, the first arrow is the pain of the aggregates, simply the pain of change, physical pain, whatever kind of pain just happens to you. But then the mind turns around and just shoots another arrow. And the Sutta, he talks about one arrow, but if you look at yourself, you find yourself with a whole quiver of arrows. You just keep shooting, shooting, shooting away. And if you're going to learn how to accept that fact, it, means, it doesn't mean you just say, well, let's just keep on shooting. It means, hey, a lot of this suffering is coming from what I'm doing. I don't have to do that. No one's compelling me to shoot arrows. It's just that that's the habit I have. And if you want to keep on shooting the arrows, you're perfectly entitled to. But do you want to? If you don't, the Buddha teaches you how to stop. And one of the important points is that first step of learning how to admit. Well, it's not just me suffering from the mood. I'm actually formulating the mood, fabricating the mood somehow. You know, step back and see exactly what you're doing. This relates very directly to one of the themes in the Buddhist teachings, is the questions you ask yourself about what's going on. And if your questions simply assume, I've got this big lump of a bad mood here, just take that as a given, and then wondering how do you react to this mood that somehow got placed on you, or you find, stuck, you find yourself stuck in. The questions that come from that assumption are just going to keep you more and more tied to the mood. But if you can step back and ask yourself, well, what's, what's the karma behind the mood? And not, we're not talking about karma from the past so much as what's your present karma around the mood? What's the present fabrication going on? Can you see it as a result of action? And some part of it you find will be determined by past actions. And we're not necessarily talking about past lifetimes, but the thoughts that went through your mind ten minutes ago, or half an hour ago, or half a day ago, that got those hormones churning to begin with. Some hormones are going to stay in your bloodstream for quite a while before they get washed out. That's an example of past karma. But you've also got the present karma that reads things and breathes around them and interprets them and tells narratives about them. And that you can change. So the Buddha is offering tools if you want to use them. You might have legitimate reasons for being in a bad mood. But it's up to you to decide, well, do you want to stay with that? Do you want to hold on to that perception that this is a legitimate bad mood? Or do you want to ask yourself, well, even if it's legitimate, do I want to stick with it? Do I want to stay with it? What pleasure am I getting out of being in this mood? Because there is that aspect, you know. Sometimes we like to punish ourselves. We like to feel 
unjustly mistreated. One of our strongest senses of self is right around there. The unjust treatment we've gotten from other people. And we wear our suffering as a badge of pride. But it's a miserable pleasure. And if you want to get out of it, the Buddha offers you tools. Some of them sound pretty abstract. He's teaching on this, that, conditionality, the Four Noble Truths, dependent core arising. They can seem awfully technical and awfully far away. But they do have a compassionate purpose, and it's important that you learn how to translate the abstractions into the immediacy of what you're doing. So you can see, oh yeah, there's a fabrication going on. The breath, I mean, that's fabrication right there. It doesn't come ready labeled. So that when you breathe in as a baby, something tells you, okay, hey, here's bodily fabrication, learn how to use this well. That's not how it comes, but it does come when we hear the Buddhist teachings and say, well, this is a useful way of looking at things. I want to learn how to internalize his teachings, understand how I can make use of them so I don't have to suffer so much. When you begin to see that those terms are actually referring to something very direct and very immediate. Then you empower yourself. You give yourself more options. A more useful way of seeing where you are and how you got here and how you can get out. The choice is yours. <laughs>